What happens after we die? Tonight we explore the ultimate mystery with spiritual leaders from many faiths. Joining us, John McCarthy, evangelical Christian pastor of Grace Community Church in Southern California, best-selling author and host of the global media ministry, Grace to You. Father Michael Manning, Roman Catholic priest, host of the international program, The Word in the World. Representing Judaism, Rabbi Marvin Heyer, the dean and founder of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Muslim scholar, Dr. Maher Hathout, a retired physician and senior advisor to the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Marianne Williamson, best-selling author and lecturer on spirituality. And Ellen Johnson, president of American Atheists. The next world, next on Larry King Live. John MacArthur, what happens when you die? Well, when you die, uh, you go to one of two places, according to Scripture. You go out of the presence of God forever, or you go into the presence of God forever. Depending? Depending upon your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which is, according to the Bible, the only way to enter heaven. So therefore, a Jew or a Muslim or a Buddhist will not go to heaven? Yeah, Christian theology and the Scripture says that only through faith in Jesus Christ. And you, and then when we say what happens, what happens? Do you go somewhere as a body? Is this yeah, no, your, your body stays. We go to the funeral, we see the body, it goes into the grave, it decays. Your spirit immediately goes either in the presence of God or out, waiting the final resurrection. There will be a resurrection of all bodies in the end, a resurrection unto life or a resurrection unto damnation. It is, John MacArthur, is it not? A guess on your, an educated guess based on your, own, your scriptures, your reading, your faith. But you don't know. You don't know, no, do you? How can you know? You don't know, no, do you? How can you know? You don't know, no, do you? How can you know? Because the Bible says so, and I no, believe... you believe the Bible. Well, I believe the Bible, but I believe the Bible can be defended. I believe through the centuries the Bible has stood the test of intense scrutiny, and it is the real and true revelation of God, and it speaks truly about life and death. And someone has been there and come back, and that's Jesus Christ. How come only one? <clears throat> How come only one what? Person ever come back. Well, uh, that's because the design of leaving this world is to go into the eternal world. The only person who came from the eternal world into this world is Jesus Christ. There have been a few others, by the way. In fact, in the Old Testament, the prophets raised a few from the dead. In the New Testament, Jesus and the apostles raised a few from the dead. And at the, at the uh, death of Christ on the cross, the graves were open and some were raised. And that's uh, indicative of the fact that there will be an actual physical resurrection to join with the spirits that are with God at death. However, to uh, Mr. MacArthur, the price for eternal life and life after death is obedience to church doctrine. So you must live a certain life <coughs> in preparation for that life after death. That I totally reject. I am not going so to. Do I. Well, what do you think? You uh, know, I reject you know, that well, completely. There is a, there well, is is a way to get. Hold it, hold it, Alan. What is your, what is? Well, uh, yeah. You I'd, said you have to believe in Christ. That you have the to only follow. way to heaven. And, I, and at this point, I respectfully disagree with the rabbi. Nobody can live a righteous life. The Bible says that no one can obey the law of God. So no, no one. one's going to heaven. So yeah. no one can go to heaven on their own merits or on their own works. No, I don't care how many good works they do. The New Testament is crystal clear on the fact so that... So a bad the, guy who believes in Christ, he's going to heaven. And yeah. a good guy who doesn't is going to heaven. But when he truly believes... That doesn't sound just. But when, he's, when he truly believes... Larry, we don't want justice. Justice, justice? No, no, it sends everybody to hell. We need grace. We but need forgiveness. We need mean, grace. We need mercy. May, may I say only, Larry, those who do, need, only those who ask. When you need grace, first of all, when you take an exam, not everybody has to get a hundred. It's preposterous to think that when you say righteous conduct, you mean perfect specimens. Human beings are not perfect specimens. In God's world, they will be accepted to eternity or eternal heaven if they pass the exam. What's a passing grade in heaven? I don't know. Maybe it's 67 and not 65. But the fact of the matter is, if you, if you uh -huh. live the decent life, that is credible. You don't have to be uh, perfect. Let me get a break. I'm right back. I hope it's 51. Uh, <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> Billy Graham told me, sure, he would, if he was going down in an airplane, he'd be scared. Scared of pain, scared, but not of dying. Scared of the method of dying, maybe. Well, absolutely You're right. You're frightened, aren't you, of dying? 
Well, uh, I think you? the pain is realistic. I, I'm, I, I don't want to go through some kind of tortuous extreme, um, but uh, going down in an airplane uh, w would be a novel way for me to go immediately to heaven. And my Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord, far better to depart and be with Christ. This is my hope. I have no fear of dying itself. I have no fear of death. Uh, it was five years ago that I was near death in the critical care unit with blood clots all over both lungs. And the truth of the matter is, Eight days later, when I came out, I had a, a disappointment because I felt like I was ready to see my Lord and I was ready to enter into all that God has prepared for them that love Him. And, and I, not that I don't love my wife, my kids, and, and enjoy the riches. I was made for social life. I was made for relationships. And that's why I hang on here. And I was made to be used by God. And I want to serve Him as long as He wants me here. But, but I'm ready to go to heaven whenever He sends the word. I'm, I'm afraid that this is based on a very serious assumption that I'm so good, I live the perfect life, when I die, I'll go to heaven. I, I, I still have to see someone who can make this statement without blinking. Can I respond to you? That, and that is, a, that is a very good statement to make. And you know what? You'll never meet that person. Because that person who can earn heaven by himself does not exist. Only one person ever lived a perfect life. That's Jesus Christ. Listen to this. This is Christianity. He imputes his life to the believing Christian. All of you believe, all of you believe this. That what? That I didn't believe what, I, Larry? That you're going somewhere. All of you believe it except Ellen. Yes. yes. I believe yes. that we are. Do all of you believe God has a plan for when you're going? Absolutely. God knows when you're God going. I believe God has a plan. Right. So Absolutely. God knew about 9-11. Sure. God. He did. Right. Okay, sure. well, when we come back, we'll ask, why did he let it go? Okay. Uh, <laughs> we'll also include your phone calls. Don't go away. He was not working for that to be Don't you question it, uh, John MacArthur, when 9-11 occurs? Don't you question your faith? No, I don't, don't question my faith. No, I mean, well, I, and the guys who took the plane into the building didn't question theirs either. <laughs> I gave, don't like that association too well. <laughs> wait a minute. They didn't give their ultimate gift? N no, because... They did not give their life? I understand that God allows death. That does not mean that I take the side of a perpetrator of murder and slaughter. I'm not saying take the side. I'm saying yeah. is, did they have a belief? Oh, sure. Okay. Sure. A misguided, a severely misguided right. one. I In guess. our opinion, it was misguided, of course. Right. But Absolutely. why is the death tragedy if death is good? Well, Why is tragic used in the word death? I'll answer that very simply. If nobody died in those towers that wasn't going to die anyway. Death is a reality. And the message is, you don't know when you're going to die, and you better be ready. Jesus told this story. He said there were some people worshiping in the temple. The Pilate's soldiers came in, sliced them up. Their blood mingled with the sacrifices. It was Passover. They said to Jesus, were they worse than everybody else? Jesus said, you better repent or you'll also die and perish. And they said a tower fell and killed 18 people in Siloam. Were they worse than everybody else because they were crushed? And Jesus said, you better repent or you'll likewise perish. Mm -hmm. The Bible says you die and after this the judgment and then heaven and hell. And you're not going into eternity as energy, you're going as a person. Let's include some calls. Clovis, California. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, if Jesus is the only way to get into heaven, was heaven empty and devoid of souls before Jesus came to earth? John? Found Oh, that's a very good question, and the answer is absolutely not. We know way back in the book of Genesis, Enoch didn't die. He walked right into the presence of God, and the prophet Elijah went to heaven in a whirlwind, and uh, David said that when he died, he would see God face to face, and Job said when he died, he'd see God face to face, and, and the prophet Daniel sp spoke about a resurrection unto life. Uh, there was clearly in the Old Testament an indication that they were going to go to heaven, but they went to heaven because God provides for those Old Testament saints the same way he does for people on this side of the life of Jesus, resurrection life for those who believe in him. Jesus paid the penalty for their sins and his righteousness was applied to them past and future. But Jesus Christ nonetheless was the one who bore their punishment even Rich. though he hadn't yet come. We're back with our panel, Lake City, Colorado. Hello. Hey there, Larry. Hi. Uh, Many of your guests have said that after we die, we either go to heaven or hell. And that's on the basis of whether we have faith in Jesus Christ or if we've done enough good deeds. And my question is, is uh, what, what, what about the baby, the infant, who has not been able to come to an understanding of Jesus or not lived enough to do 
the good deeds to merit heaven. Or John, someone who doesn't even know about Jesus, an yeah. aborigine. Yeah, I, I've written a book uh, which has been widely received and I'm very encouraged by it by nursing associations and hospitals. It's called Safe in the Arms of God. And it takes an Old Testament, New Testament look at what happens to babies that die. And as I told you when we met the first time after 9-11, and you said, what happened to that baby at the bottom of that tower? And I said, instant heaven. And I said that in just that fast order because I had just prepared that book and the, I think the weight of scripture is very clear that infants that die or, or people who are mentally unable to make decisions and to operate in faith toward God, God gathers to himself and I think scripture is clear on that. Do all of you agree on that, Father Matthew? I think it's really important. I agree, certainly. <coughs> but I think there's an important thing as a Christian for me to understand in my understanding of Jesus that although I believe Jesus is the Son of God and he is the source of salvation of all, but there's been a huge scandal of pedophilia in the Catholic Church. And, you know, these are very good, upright people brought up with high moral standards. But the repression and the guilt and the moral uh, rage that comes with that allows this shadow to emerge. And these Catholic Do priests can't help themselves. I believe that he can be able to be expressed in ways far beyond what I can understand. And so for me to con condemn a person who loves the Father. Because, you know, when you look at the most self-righteous, moralistic people, they have the deepest, darkest shadows. A Jew or a Muslim that loves the Father and say, well, Jesus is... The deepest, darkest shadows. Say, well, Jesus is not... How do, how do you view Jesus, Rabbi? I would say that uh, Jesus was a great teacher. I do not believe he was divine. I do not believe he was the Son of God. And I might add, if Moses would claim to be that he's the son of God, I would reject that as well. I would say that uh, Jesus was a great teacher. I do not believe he was divine. I do not believe he was the son of God. And I might add, if Moses would claim to be that he's the son of God, I would reject that as well. I would say that uh, Jesus was a great teacher. I do not believe he was divine. I do not believe he was the son of God. And I might add, if Moses would claim to be that he's the son of God, I would reject that as well. Moses would claim to be that he's the son of God, I would reject that as well. well what does uh, Dr. Hathut uh, believe? <clears throat> I think uh, our stand is almost identical to the rabbi. However, we believe that Jesus Christ is very special in a way be because he is born to the Virgin Mary. So, and you believe she was yeah, a virgin? Oh, yes. The Muslims believe? The Muslims believe there is a whole chapter in the Quran. For us, what's your message? My message is, if you don't accept Islam, you are going to hell. Okay, Jesus he says, says if we don't accept Islam, we're going to hell. There you go. There you go. God raises up vessel of destruction, and here is one right here. China. Jesus came out of China. Look at that. Jesus was born of a virgin, you filthy pig. Oh, poor filthy pig. God does not come with a vagina. God is most high. 
God is most high. He does not walk. God does not use the restroom. God does not sleep. God does not eat. Your God doesn't, because his God does not exist. That's right. Yes. The Muslims believe. The Muslims believe there is a whole chapter in the Quran called Mary to, to, to highlight that. Do you think that Christians will go to heaven? No. Do you think that the Jews will go to heaven? No. Do you think that anybody who is non-Muslim will go to heaven? No. So you think the only way to get to heaven is through Allah and leading the life of a Muslim? That's right. Why do you think that? Because this is what is revealed in the Quran. This is what the Quran explained to me. And shouldn't we be loving the Muslims like our neighbors? Oh, I love the Muslims. I'd love to lead them to Christ. But I don't, I don't want them coming to my, my home and cutting off the heads of my children. There's not very much at all holy about Muhammad. He was a very evil man. As a matter of fact, I think much of the Quran was inspired by the devil himself. Inspired by the devil himself. Man Rabbuki? Allah. Ain Allah? Man Nabiyuk? Ain Wulid al Rasul? Makkah. Ila Ain Haj al Rasul? Madina. Madinuki? كم عدد أركان الإسلام؟ كم عدد أركان الإيمان؟ ما عمود الدين؟ ما أعظم واجب علينا؟ ما أعظم الذنوب؟ هل يعلم أحد الغيب سوى الله؟ من هم المغضوب عليهم؟ من هم الضالين؟ ما اسم الفرقة التي أثارت مسألة خلق القرآن؟ ما من هو العالم الذي رفض القول بخلق القرآن؟ ولنا في رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قد حسنة حيث عقد على زوجته عائشة وكان سنها ست سنوات وبنى عليها يعني دخل عليها صلى الله عليه وسلم تسع سنوات. يقول ست سنوات. لا عقد عليها وهي ستة. وتزوج. العقد في ستة وال والبناء اللي هو الدخول في تسع سنوات. ولا في رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. نعم. أسوة حسنة. بس خل خل أوضح لك شغلة. ولكن طبعا. أنا أنا سؤالي سؤال لك إنه واحد عمره 12 سنة واحدة عمره 11 سنة هل هذا الزواج منطقي مجاز شرعيا؟ إذا كان إذا كان الولي الأب الولي ما هو الولاية تنقسم إلى قسمين يا يكون الولي هو الأب فإذا زوج الأب ابنته على الرجل الكوف لها فهذا طبعا زواج صحيح يعني في طروف للناس واحد رجل عنده بنت بنتين ثلاثة أربعة وطبعا يريد أن أن يسافر لديه ظروف طيب هل تضيع هذه وليس لديها محارب أليس من الأفضل أننا نأخذ لها على إنسان تبقى عنده حتى يصونها وحتى, وحتى يصرف عليها فإذا ما بلغت سن الدخول دخل عليها وما قال أن الناس كلهم ذئاب كاسرة Here's a picture of a pope kissing the Quran. We could spend hours talking about the Islam and the other religions. There's an excellent little bitty comic book called The Prophet you can get from our ministry. It's like two dollars or something like that uh, by Jack Chick. He goes through the history of the Muslim church and how they started. Very few people realize it was the Catholics that started Islam. They started the whole religion purposely to try to get the Holy Land back for the Catholics. They built up the Islam, <clears throat> they, they funded Muhammad, they trained him, they sent a Catholic nun out of the monastery. They said, we want you to come out of your co convent, go find a young promising uh, Muslim, marry him, and train him to raise up an army of Arabs to go take back the Holy Land for the Mother Church. Quite an interesting story if you want to read about that. It, it started to work, but then it failed because the Islam got so big, they said, well, forget you Catholics, we're doing what we want. And I don't think most Muslims, which is now, what, 10, 20 percent of the world population, Islam, I don't think most of them know that they really started off as a front for the Catholic Church. So we believe that he is described as the word of God and a spirit from him to the Virgin Mary. Marianne, but what do we you don't believe that he is the son of God. Marianne, what do you believe? 
I believe that we are all the sons of God. And I believe that Jesus was and is a fully actualized, he was a fully actualized human being who now has the function of helping others who choose, uh, who feel that he is their way to help them rise as well. But I was so glad to hear the Father say that he acknowledges as a Christian that there are those who experience that vortex, as it were, without the name Jesus on it. And I find it very unfortunate and um, a slightly offensive this notion that if someone does not proclaim the name Jesus you're talking about Jews you're talking about atheists you're talking about agnostics Hindus Muslims Buddhists who somehow even if they aren't babies if they do not proclaim the name Jesus to me that is an incorrect yeah. John, understanding of Jesus himself and I appreciate what she's saying the bottom line is that this is an authority issue the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other name Why than the name of Jesus that's Christ. that's the only word? Because I believe the Bible is true. So he believes the Koran was true. Well, I understand that, but I believe the Bible is true. I believe the Bible stands up scientifically, historically, prophetically. I believe every okay. test to the scripture there's yields no, the truth. No, uh, but you know, Larry, there are no hypocrites described in the Bible, but the Bible well, is true. Well, I meant to hold it. We've got to take a break. Ellen, what, what do you believe about Jesus Christ? Well, I'm here to give the reality point of view, I guess, because the reality is that there is not one shred of secular evidence that there was ever a Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in Christianity is a modern religion, and Jesus Christ is a compilation from a lot of other gods, Horus, Mithra, who had the same origins, the same death as the mythological Jesus Christ. So you don't believe there was a Jesus Christ? There was not. It's not what I believe, that there, there is no secular evidence that J.C., Jesus Christ, ever existed. Tonight, what makes someone kill? Why does God allow innocent children to be abducted and murdered? Is good actually stalked by evil? Spiritual leaders and other experts debate these profound, eternal, and unsettling questions. Dr. John MacArthur, Christian pastor of Grace Community Church in Southern California, also a best-selling author and a host of the global ministry, Grace to You. Deepak Chopra, the world-renowned spiritual teacher and best-selling author. Father Jim Kider, Catholic priest and editor-at-large of CatholicExchange.com. Plus Shar Margolis, spiritual intuitive and best-selling author. And Roger DePue, the legendary criminal profiler formerly with the FBI, author of a remarkable new book, Between Good and Evil. And they're all next on Larry King Live. John MacArthur, what do you believe? Well, I think it's not only a potential in everyone, I think it's a reality in everyone. We we'll all have some evil in us. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, the Bible is very clear on that. All of us are evil. All have sinned, the Bible says. So then says. how do we separate? We put some in jail and some we don't? If you, you mean Yeah, well, evil doesn't manifest itself in all of us in the same way. Not everybody is as bad as it's possible to be. There are restraints. Restraints because we've been taught moral law, the way we've been brought up, because we have come to know God. There's a Holy Spirit restraint. There's restraint by conscience. There's restraint by law and government. I mean, not everybody's as bad as they could be. But I think uh, uh, Roger DePew pointed out in his book a really important point. He was talking about one of the guys in the FBI that he was speaking with who said to him, it's really easy to get into the criminal mind. And he said he laid down at night, this friend of his, and said, my God, that's me. And I think every one of us know down inside there's potential for evil there and reality of evil is there. We're talking about good and evil. John MacArthur, do you understand the sexual predator of a young child? I cannot comprehend that. I, I cannot comprehend that anything. Is the ultimate evil act? Uh, on a human level, yeah. Right. On a human level, what that has to What if it's not be. prevented? What if the person doing it has no control over the urge to do it? Well, I, I think by the time they do it, they have no control over it. It's, it's right. how they got there and, and how we have to go back to the beginning and see to put restraints on these kinds of people so they don't end up that way. It's a series of choices that get you but to that point. how do you point. spot them? You think it's a choice someone chooses to... Uh, I think there's a series of choices that begin in childhood. It may be because of... Uh, it may be informed by parent, uh, parental things, as you've heard. It may be because of abusive situations in the home. Uh, somewhere along the line, and the breakdown of the family and the breakdown of godly character in the home and the family, we potentiate this kind of thing in those kinds of bizarre people who who go that direction ultimately. What is the spiritual world, if you represent that world, what does right. it think of? Well, I, first of all, I feel it's really important for people to have healthy mental health. 
I think psychology is a very important field and that thoughts create reality thoughts are things and we have free will we have choice and it's not all planned out because we're here to learn lessons so we have a choice to do good or bad are you saying a but, predator of a six-year-old boy chooses that well, he wants to well do a six first of all if their their parents hurt them or molested them maybe they feel it's okay to do that i mean but if if they were psychologically healthy they wouldn't be doing this and a lot of times fathers are doing this to their kids and the mother knows about it and doesn't want anyone to see it so they put it under the carpet because they don't want to cause problems well, in the marriage. Well, then we go back to why is the father doing it to the kid? Well, yeah, exactly. Well, why is he doing it? Because somehow he's, he's been either he's either chemically imbalanced yeah. but also in the spirit world, I, if, if just one second, please, sorry. Um, I think that, that, that we all are guided by the universe and if you want to call it God and I believe in God spirits that that to me God is love and that sometimes those trickster energies can come in and also influences influence so is not controlled by minds. the person well we the trickster coming well in? no no I'm just saying sometimes that can happen so then are we controlling it or not Sometimes we are, and sometimes yeah, we, we're, we not. Not, we're not. Not everything in life is black and white. Yeah, and, and I would agree with that. I, I think you can get so out of control in your life that you yield up to demon power. Mm -hmm. Great illustration of that in the life of Jesus. There was a boy possessed of a demon, and the demon kept slamming the boy into the fire. This is this is classic destruction of a child in the scripture, and it was the demon that was slamming. Now you can ask the question, how did that demon get residence in that boy? Right. And of course, sin opens up anybody to that potential. We don't have all the answers though, do we? We don't know, we don't know the, no. the exact answer to Father, that. Father, is your church, which was faced with the problem of this, has it investigated the whys? Why someone does this? Uh, first of all, you know, it's an atrocity that one, I personally cannot, cannot fathom. But when we talk about evil, I think we do need to, to make the distinction that obj evil can, is objective um, in that we as human beings, we're created by God. And as created by God, we always seek the good. So even when we sin, we're not choosing an evil. We're seeing a good. And that's the, 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 the great mystery, and that's the, the, the malfeasance that takes place the lie that takes place in evil, we actually are seeing something that's good you mean, but because of culture, because of, of uh, environment as we've heard, because of upbringing, the, the lack of family life, all these things, you know, a person might not, I mean, when you said uh, they don't have that opportunity to choose the, the good if they're, they're in that presence and they're just so compelled, I mean, that's an addiction. Are you saying that the sinner thinks he's doing good? Uh, the sinner, as we believe as Catholics, uh, as a human being, we can only choose the good. And so when we sin, we're actually choosing something that we think is good, but objectively, it is evil. For example, a mother that may, may go out and steal bread uh, to feed her child. Well, the intention of that mother is to feed the child. The circumstances is she needs to care for the child. But objectively, stealing is always evil. It's always yeah. a sin. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Because you can talk about bread, but what are you going to talk about when you talk about a predator? What are you going to talk about when you talk about a guy burying a girl, a little tiny girl, in plastic well, bags you alive? Don't, you don't have the in answer. The well, the answer is this. That's not good, no matter how you cut it. Right, and that's I'm not, not saying somebody seeking good. That, and I'm not somebody saying that that's doing a good horrible agree. evil. But, but what, that what person, are you saying, Father? But that person that's committing that horrid crime at that moment, in their minds, they don't see a wrong. I mean, the, the, something is compelling them to do that. Oh, and, uh, and, and it's very that people wrong. look at if you're raised with knowing good and bad as a child, you're going to know what's right so and wait wrong. Wait a minute, that, no, I'll, I'll back him up a minute. You, so in other words, this person doing this is saying, "I know I'm evil. Boy, I'm bad." 
Sure. You're saying they're saying that. I, I think some people. The villain calls his hair in the morning and says, I'm a villain. I think some of them are, and some of them aren't. Well, I think that, some that's of them, easy to say. But some of them aren't. But, it's, but there is no answer. There's no cut, clean answer to this. Some of them are, and some of them aren't. But many people know right and wrong. Weren't you taught me, right me, and wrong from your parents? Let me get, yeah. But okay. also, we, all right, I'll get to the question of who's right is who's wrong. Who's evil is who's good. We'll be right back right after this. Nine Eleven thought they were attacking evil. Absolutely. Then is it perspective? Who's evil? Is who? It's perspective in that case. But you know, coming back to pedophilia and whether there's a choice or not, this is the eternal argument. You know, do we live in a universe of determinism or free will? And the answer is, it's simultaneously both. You know, if you don't have awareness, if your consciousness is constricted and fearful and isolated, and if you've been subjected to trauma and child abuse, then you more or less become a bundle of conditioned reflexes and nerves that's constantly triggered by people and circumstance into very predictable outcomes. So many of these pedophiles cannot help themselves. And you know, not to really belabor the point, but there's been a huge scandal of pedophilia in the Catholic Church. And you know, these are very good, upright people brought up with high moral standards but the repression and the guilt and the moral uh, rage that comes with that allows this shadow to emerge and these Catholic Do priests can't help themselves. John, don't you think that very often doctrinaire creates this? Absolutely. Uh, no, I, I would, so? no, I would take, a, I would take another approach to that. I, I would say that's potentially true, but I would say the only thing that's going to end everybody having their own standards of what is right and wrong, the only thing is to have a uniform authority, a single set of laws that govern the whole world. And that's, of course, why the Bible was written. God's law is there. It's explicit about how we conduct ourselves but in this world. there are more world. people who don't believe that law sure, than believe. But that doesn't change the fact that it is the law of and, God. And if, and if everybody know, does right in his own eyes, then you have a collision of all There are five billion people on this planet. Not everybody is a Christian. I didn't talk about being a Christian, although I wish everybody on the planet I know were you a would. Christian. I but, know you would. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm talking about uh, law. I'm talking about moral law the, given by moral God. Moral law is a byproduct of your awareness. It's not some law that you follow then, and that then you I don't... Am the, then I am the source of moral law? I don't think so. I think God is the source of that moral law. Uh, and and that's exactly. you, in your case, uh, the definition of God is just, uh, you know, some... Where, do, where does our morale... Where does it come from, Shaw? Where does our morality come from? I think uh, it comes from what we learn as, as a child and also what our conscience, our conscience tells us. And where does the conscience come from? Our conscience, I feel, comes from our guidance from a divine being, call it God, call it the universe, call it Moha what about call it, you know, Allah or God or Christ, whatever. It doesn't matter if if we are all it based in love and compassion and truth. Uh, Larry, one that, that last word that she said is truth, and, and that's the main thing that we really need to be focusing on here is there's objective truth. When he was, uh, John was just referring to moral law, uh, I mean, we could, instead of uh, saying moral law in relation to Christianity, we could talk about natural law, and we're talking about objective yeah. truth. And, and what's going on in, in the culture, in the world today, is we have cultural relativism, uh, individualistic relativism, mm -hmm. where people are creating their own moral law rather than you know, it being objective. For one person, yeah. this is a lie, and for someone else, it's not. Well, you know Larry, what the biggest Larry, problem is? Larry, I just is? wanted to make uh, one no, observation. Let me get a break, and then we'll pick right up with that. We'll take a break. I'll reintroduce the panel. We'll also include your phone calls. Don't go away. <laughs> Deepak, were the men who took the planes on 9-11, were they evil? Well, certainly from our perspective, they were. And anybody who writes... But from writes, theirs, they weren't. From theirs, they weren't. I mean, you know, it's traditional, as I said, to demonize the enemy. Unless you do that, it's impossible to kill. So, you know, we end up comparing our ideas of acceptable slaughter. So we don't think it's evil to drop a bomb with depleted uranium. And if uh, women and children die on the streets, we call it collateral damage. 
Now, from the other side's perspective, that's evil. But, of course, our idea of worse form of slaughter is a beheading or a suicide bombing. Mm. So, you know, it's all a question of your cultural, your religious, right. and your spiritual well indoctrination. Now, John, how do you balance that? They don't think they're evil. They think you're evil. Right, and I think you have to go back to the standard, the, the universal standard of the law of God, which is that killing is evil. Therefore, we kill and they kill, we're now, all evil. The, the next question to ask is, are they the evil aggressor, uh, or are they the defender of those that are being killed? They would killed? argue that with you. Well, they would say they are the, the, there's no question they were the evil aggressor. I mean, the people they killed weren't attacking them. The bottom line is you can, under, you can justify a war on the basis of defending people from deadly force that is being pushed upon them. Always in, in our country, we have stood for the people that are being harmed. Yeah, but if you're a, you're a mailman in Hiroshima, that explanation ain't going to go for it. Oh, I understand right. that. I understand <laughs> that. I'm not work. saying it's a, perfect, <laughs> it's a perfect solution, but I at least can say there's a place to stand up and defend people who are being destroyed. Whether well, obviously, those sure. people were innocents. So, I mean, but stop Hitler innocent. with, well, with other, the course, World War II. You know. But other innocents have always been killed. Sure. Killing is, so Larry killing is, is American as apple pie. It's not going to be a perfect situation, of course. Yeah. Good evening, Larry. How are you? Fine. My question is for Pastor MacArthur. Somewhere in Scripture, it talks about the curses of man being passed on from generation to generation. And I just wanted to know his thoughts on, you know, wh how that would be today uh, on the subject that we're talking about. And he has blessed my heart for many years. So, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, I think that, that that's the real issue. God created the world good. Um, man fell, as uh, we just heard. He fell into sin, and when he fell, the whole race went with him because the whole race was in the loins of Adam and Eve, and all that came out of Adam and Eve bear the weight of that fall. Just from eating an apple. Well, from disobeying God, from distrusting God and believing Satan rather than God, which was blasphemy toward God, a serious sin, not just eating an apple. Then what happens in the New Testament, it says, as in Adam, all died. The whole race went down the drain. There's goodness left in the world because the image of God is still there, though it's marred and it's scarred by our fallenness. We still see that image there. We still see vestiges of that goodness. But the heart of man, the Bible says, is still wicked and evil and needs redemption, and that's why the gospel comes. So Roger, you're an FBI guy who became a seminarian. Do you believe that? I, I believe that, yes. Uh, I think that... Uh that uh, Jesus Christ was uh, a redeemer and, uh, and that we, we n desperately needed redemption. The problem is that, uh, that not enough people are, are uh, accepting that uh, concept that, uh, that we all need redemption. And why don't they accept it? Uh, I think it's uh, largely because they, uh, uh, their early childhood it's it's an educational process it's a socialization process mm -hmm. and uh, we're not doing a very good job especially in this day and age of uh, of imparting those basic truths those universal truths to uh, to our younger generation you believe you know, that Shar? yeah i do think that that it starts in the home and these are universal and truths it, yeah i think there are certain universal truths but everyone everyone's truth is a little bit different so people need to kind of maybe have one basic simple well, isn't there one law that covers everybody in the world do unto others as you would have and that i you. think that's really that wise covers, of you to say that covers I agree the with red you. light and it covers income tax evasion <laughs> and it covers murder <laughs> i agree with right? you right it covers yeah, everything do but, unto uh, others but th there's well, another you know, one the old testament gave before that love the lord your god with all your heart yeah, soul mind strength even if you don't right. if you do unto others as you would have them do unto you you're a pretty good guy yeah you'll get along with even men. if you I, don't love the you lord know, no no you know, you'll get along with men the question is how are you going to get along yeah, with but, god uh, if you uh, don't, yeah but that i'll worry about later you know when if you do unto others as you would have them do unto you you're pretty good you could be an atheist right if you but do that's unto that others, tension but yeah, you'll be, a, you'll be a nicer atheist. You'll be a, you'll be able to get along. Well, I'd rather be a, wouldn't you rather be a nicer atheist than a bad Christian? 
<laughs> I'd rather be a Christian. Yeah. No, no. But that's the tension that exists within <laughs> us as far as, you know, we, we are, you know, to love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul. But yet at that same time, you know, when we spoke, speak about being a good person, we need to be following, you know, the, the truth, the beauty, the goodness in which God has created us in how we treat other human beings. And uh, there is that uh, dichotomy right. that's going on constantly. Larry, Larry you, you know, know do a, I have to believe in God to be good? Uh, no, you don't have to no. believe in God to be good. And, you know, the universe is so set up to express maximum diversity. So whatever you can think of in the realm of human imagination, that behavior exists there. And before we become so self-righteous about the whole thing, I think it's important to remember <laughs> another golden rule from Christ. He said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. I think many times the self-righteous morality turns out to be just a lot of hypocrisy because you know when you look at the most self-righteous moralistic people they have the deepest darkest shadows. But you know on that point right. if you if we if we use Jesus as an example Jesus hated sin so objective evil he hated that but, but he, he was also because he but was he a, loved a sinner. Yeah but that's a very good point I think that's a very good point by the way the Dalai Lama says the same thing, hate the sin but not the sinner. Exactly. And, you know, and then you can do something about it. Well, as, and I agree with Deepak, it's with, in the Bible they say, judge not lest ye be judged. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. And so, let me get a break, and, we'll be and back Deepak, with more. Deepak, I have to tell you, I love your book, The Seven <laughs> Spiritual. <laughs> we'll, be right, we'll be right back with more, don't go away. Hudson, North Carolina, hello. Uh, yes, sir. My question to the panel is, um, do they believe that there is a God which represents the good, you know, that they keep talking about, and a devil which represents the evil that they talk about, and that you must choose the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior in order to go to heaven, and if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you will die and go to a devil's hell. No matter what good you do in life. No matter what good that we do in life, we can never be good enough. What, uh, John MacArthur, what if you don't know about Jesus Christ, who's an aborigine? Well, first of all, let me say uh, what she said is a reflection of biblical Christianity, so mm -hmm. it is accurate. Um, if you don't know about the truth, there's no other way to be saved. That's why the Bible commands us but to go into all the world and preach but, the gospel to every creature. What if someone dedicates their life to, to helping homeless children or people in third world countries, and they happen to be Jewish? And they don't accept Then they Christ go to hell. Savior. Then they go yeah. to hell, just yeah. like you and me. Yeah, right. But you know what? There's the law. I believe in the law of karma. What comes around goes around. And if you're good now, it will come back. And if, if you do something negative, let, let it comes back this. to you let as well. Let me just clarify this real simple. Okay, there are two religions in the world. Just two. One is the, the true Christian religion of divine accomplishment. You can't be good enough. Nobody can. You only get there through Christ's goodness being applied to you when you believe in his death and resurrection. Every other system in the world, Hindu, Muslim, Spiritist, you name it, believes you get there by your works. Those are the only two. Make your choice. You can pick from all the religions of the world, and it's all the same thing. Christianity stands alone based upon the authority of Scripture. You have to be careful, though. I mean, to say that Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior, and then believe that I'm going to be saved, and I can do whatever I want, it is not true. I mean, we believe That's in right. Jesus it's Christ, not... but then our actions need to exhume and, and show that we believe in Jesus Christ well, and how we live and how we act you know uh, definitely has to display that not just in statement you know what I would go so far as to say that if they don't display that then you're not a Christian you don't have Christ Christ doesn't reside in your life you don't possess the Holy Spirit because if you do you will be transformed you'll why. be a new creation Beverly Hills California hello yeah hello I'm confused about a few things when my mother passed on Ten evil people were against me only because of money. In the Bible, the Old Testament, it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The New Testament says, forgive them because they do not know better. Which yeah. way do you go here? John? Yeah, the Old Testament law, lex talionis, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, was given to the national entity of Israel as a governmental principle based in the justice system so that if somebody committed a crime, a punishment consistent with that crime was to be brought upon that person's head. So that's that's just justice. What? 
Well, thou shalt not kill means do not murder someone. But if you commit that murder, then you lose your life, capital punishment. But nonetheless, the principle of forgiveness still exists. You forgive the person no matter what they do against you. That doesn't preclude government doing what it should do to bring about justice in the case of a crime. That viewer's question though also brings about and shows that transformation that takes place. I mean, in the Goths or in the Old Testament, even prior to eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, it was, you hurt someone in my family, I wipe out your family. And then it progressed to an eye to an eye. And then with Jesus Christ, we have this complete transformation, you know, with forgiveness, you know, turn the other cheek. Um, well, but you know what, but you don't cast pearls before swine. And if, in, if you if you understand karma, you know that in, if, if people don't get it back in this world, they're going to get it back in the next world. They're going to pay for that? it. If you believe that. Because I talk to spirits every day of my life, and I give proof to people and, and bridge that love and John, to you, with that's people from the spirit right? world to the living. That's and heal. We do so much but healing. But if you believe in his life after death, you believe she can talk to him. Why can't she talk to him? No, I, I think that's very dangerous. The, the, Bible, the Bible would say she's interacting with demon powers, and they all come well, from the darkness. Well, you know what? You say she's proven your point, though. There you know what? There's good and her. evil in every... In every good and evil, evil in every... In every religion, in every practice. There's good doctors, bad doctors, good psychiatrists, bad, good priests, bad priests. I mean, come on. I mean, come on. It, it, there, are, there are people who are honorable and ethical, which I am in my work, and I help people with what I do. Oh, and I I, you I, can I, talk to, I've been doing this for 30 years, you can you call think, any one of my Deepak, clients. we're running short on time. Do you think we're ever going, are we getting better? I think overall we're getting better, Larry. You but do. you know, Christianity is a religion of uh, the meek, of forgiveness, of redemption. And what Christ said is, forgive them, for they know not what they do, is another way of saying that everybody is doing the best they can from the level of awareness they're in. And I think we should understand that there's a role for love, compassion, understanding, and rehabilitation, and not always have this idea that there is uh, absolute good, and there's absolute evil, and we have to get rid of, of the evil people because, you know, that will never solve the problem. The but problem, there is, there there is the objective. The problem Roger, for me, Larry, Larry, Roger, Roger got 20 seconds. Christian Roger, yeah. going to war. The Roger. problem for me, Larry, is that uh, you can't rehabilitate someone who has never been habilitated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and what I mean by that is that We're running some, out of time, of, Roger. some of these people have... Uh, have learned to be evil and uh, and we must uh, we can't rehabilitate them we have to have go to into the prisons and change and change the way they think thank thank you all very much John MacArthur, Deepak Chopra, Father Jim uh, Kiter, Shah Margolis and Roger DePew author of Between Good and Evil on tonight's edition of Larry King Live I'm very strong against that uh, when I experienced Jesus in the Bible I experienced a man for example who had a great friend in the John the Baptist, um, who was killed by a, uh, a tyrant. He was executed at a birthday party. Um, he knew what Roman subjugation was, and in the midst of all of that, and all of that terrible thing, what did he do? He brings in uh, Simon the Zealot, who was a, a terrorist, as one of his apostles. He also brings in Matthew, who was a tax collector with Herod, who was in cahoots with the Romans. He's bringing all of these diverse people, bringing unity, bringing peace, and bringing understanding. And his response was not, well, okay, let's, let's go get him. Although many of his followers wanted him to be that, that King David that was going to be the great warrior to overcome things. So and think, he, he resisted that. You think he would be opposed to Oh, this? he would be very much. He, peace, let, let's move with peace. Let's, let's talk. Let's move and, and, and move with strong force to a peaceful... Max, Hi, Larry. I have to agree with Dr. Jones and everything that he has said. My question to your panel is, do they think that Hussein believes in religion or actually cares about prayer when he kills members of his own family? And well, he says that this confused. He says he prays, John MacArthur. Saddam Hussein, I'm sure he does. He prays five times a day, I believe. Yeah, unfortunately. Now, he believes, right? He yeah, believes it. He must be praying to something. Well, it's the wrong God, unfortunately. There's only one true and living God, and that's the God of the Scriptures, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not praying to that God, you're praying to no one. But he doesn't believe that. So well, what do you he do believes, when you deal with that? I mean, how do you deal with that? His belief may be as strong as your belief. Sure, but you can believe that you could fly and jump off a five-story building. It doesn't make it real. Uh, unfortunately, false religion is the ultimate is deception. Is the Muslim world all false? 
Well, the theology of Islam is false. It's the wrong God. It's the wrong so, view of but Christ. But when they hear that, don't they get that as an anti-American thought? It has nothing American. to do with America. I would say that if I was French. That has nothing to do with America. They think just, yours is they, the wrong God. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. But uh, there, has to be, there has to be truth um, and, and untruth. And once you've established the truth, and I think the Word of God has been established as true, I think it can hold up under the most intense scrutiny and uh, other books do not, other Bishop, holy books. Don't you believe, Bishop Talbert, that Christianity is the right path? I believe it is for Christians, but uh, we are not here tonight to settle, to settle which religion is right. That, settled, that dispute belongs to God. We are here to practice what we preach. But and you believe Christian. your religion is right, don't you? Oh, yes, I do. Or else why believe it? That is right. So therefore, the other religions have to be wrong. No, I don't say that at all. I don't follow that. No, if I don't. you believe your religion is right, I, my, the other religions I are believe, wrong. I believe my God is large enough to be inclusive of all human beings who are created in God's image. And that includes those religions that are not Christians. Okay. I want to ask you a question then. Why did Jesus say, uh, why did Paul say, if any man preaches any other Christ than the true Jesus Christ, let him be accursed, let him be anathema. Yeah. Uh, why does the Bible say, neither is there salvation in any other, other name than Jesus Christ? Why does the scripture condemn anyone who rejects Jesus Christ and the gospel of Christ? Why yeah. is the message so exclusive? For me, in salvation scripture? in Jesus Christ is the way. And what I try to do as a Christian is to live that example my responsibility is not to convert all other religions, but to live the Christian faith in the face of those religions. Are you going to say that uh, my our friend on the show tonight who is Jewish is on the wrong path? That's God's choice. That's God's judgment, not mine. Bellingham, I, well, we have some letters from viewers who have written, and we've got John in here to answer some of them for us now. John, thanks again for being here with us. Oh, it's always a pleasure, Tom. Thank you. We've got some questions from some viewers. Larry writes, Dear John, citing the rich man and Lazarus passage, I believe the answer to this question is yes, but I wanted to check with you. My <laughs> question is, when unbelievers enter eternal judgment, do they become fully aware of that truth of the gospel message and the fact that they rejected the truth all their lives? More specifically, will atheists fully acknowledge the one and only true God? Will followers of every false religion completely understand the truth of Christianity and the fact that they were deceived their entire lives and followed fictitious gods? Well, uh, l let me answer it in a simple way. In, in Philippians chapter 2, it says that God has declared Jesus to be Lord and at the name of Jesus every knee will bow on the earth under the earth and that means that whether a person is in heaven or in hell their knee will bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and the obvious response to that with regard to the question is they are going to know that they are under the sovereign judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. so yes they will all know that their religion was false mm -hmm. that they have been duped and deceived and damned by that false system they are going to know that Jesus Christ is Lord God is king of hell. God is the one who destroys both soul and body in hell. They're going to know that. There will be a full understanding of that. One other aspect of it is that they will have a fully informed conscience hmm. as to their own wickedness and their own evil and their own unbelief and their own rejection. So they will be under full understanding of their own sinfulness, their own rejection of the gospel, the sovereignty of God and the lordship of Christ being exercised in judgment. Wow. Thank you, John, for that. That was a profound answer to me. Tracy writes this, when the rapture takes place and the church no longer remains on the earth, is the Holy Spirit still present on earth, or is he also gone with the church? And if so, how do those left behind get saved? Do they just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and become saved? Does Jesus send the Holy Spirit to dwell in those that repent? Well, first of all, the Holy Spirit is God, and God is omnipresent so there's no place that he isn't in existence so the idea that when the church leaves the Holy Spirit leaves is not only impossible but unbiblical mm. furthermore during the time of the tribulation period the greatest revival in human history takes place 
You have more people converted in a seven-year period than at any other time in history. And that's laid out very clearly in Scripture. The whole nation Israel essentially comes to faith in Christ. The rebels are purged out and finally Israel embraces Jesus Christ as Messiah, looks on him whom they pierced, etc., etc. Well, that can't happen apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. For it is the Spirit who gives life. So the notion that the Spirit is going to be taken away is not true. Mm. Now what is true is this that there is a ministry that the Holy Spirit has now and has had through all human history called the ministry of restraint. Hmm. Uh, the world is a bad place. It's full of sin and evil and wickedness, but it isn't as bad as it could be because the restrainer, the Holy Spirit, holds it back. During that period of tribulation, the restrainer lets go. Hmm. So there's a sense in which evil will reach epic and unheard of proportions because the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit is released. But at the same time, the work of salvation will be carried on by the Holy Spirit during that period. The greatest revival ever will take place. Because the Holy Spirit is God. That's a wonderful answer. Hal from Michigan asked, John, I understand that experiencing preaching and studying God's Word, the Bible, equips us for life in this world. I'm wondering if the knowledge we obtain today will accompany us into eternity, and if so, for what purpose? Well, first of all, it will. Our Christian life here, our Christian growth, our spiritual development, our knowledge of Scripture, all of those maturing things that are going on in our lives as we expose ourselves to the Word and the power of the Spirit, affect how we live, how we witness, how we serve the Lord, and that all affects our eternal reward. Mm -hmm. So when we go to heaven, we're going to be rewarded. There are certain crowns promised to the believer. There are rewards promised to us for the things in our lives that you would classify as gold, silver, precious stones. So. In a very real sense, our place in eternity, the role we are going to be given, the kind of service we will render to the Lord and the kind of reward we will receive is defined and determined by how we live our lives here and how we live our lives here is determined by how we respond to the Word of God. So that is true. But on the other hand, it isn't going to be necessary for us when we get to heaven to reach back and try to remember some spiritual principle that we learned while we were here. Because the Bible says when we see the Lord, we'll know as we are known. So we will instantaneously have full knowledge. Great. John, thank you so much for your answers and for your time today. If you liked hearing those answers from God's Word, let me encourage you. There's plenty more where that came from. From resources that we have and we can make available to you from grace to you, they're designed to bring biblical clarity to the question of life. And they're all just a call or mouse click away. You can visit us online at www.gty.org or by phone at 888-57-GRACE. It's our privilege to serve you in this way. Thank you for making grace to you a part of your life and through your prayers and gifts, a part of your ministry. Take care. Well, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. Um, I got into the acting business when I was about nine years old. And when I was 14, I got the role of Mike Seaver in Growing Pains. And at that time, no one knew it was going to be a big hit. Uh, I was late for the audition. I ran in there, uh, did my best, and uh, turned to the director and said, uh, so is this show a comedy or what? And he kind of thought to himself, I think this guy just got himself the part because Mike was not supposed to be the sharpest knife in the drawer. I would have categorized myself as an atheist for most of my life. Didn't believe in God, couldn't see Him, so I had no reason to believe in Him. Uh, I certainly didn't have some sort of an emotional crutch that I felt was necessary to get me through life. I was living large. I was uh, on a great television program by the time I was 14 making more money than my father and more money than most people and could have anything that I wanted. So adopting a religious mindset would only put a wet blanket on all my fun. It really wasn't until I was about 17 or 18 years old that I started thinking about more important things. Uh, life, death, what else is out there beyond what I've already got? I've grabbed the golden ring, so to speak. Is this all there is? Is this really the end of the line? Have I got the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? 
What happens when I die? Because all this is going to be gone. Then what? Well, you know, the old theologians used to say that in the human heart there's a God-shaped vacuum that only God can satisfy. Uh, the book of Proverbs says that if you pursue riches, riches will never satisfy you. The heart of man is never, ever satisfied in those things. However, being satisfied with God, then you can enjoy all the things that God gives you because you see them as coming from His good hand. If you're just pursuing riches, pursuing riches, you know, the old Rockefeller story, you have so much, somebody said to him, how much do you want? He said, just a little bit more. If that's what you live for, then you're never going to be satisfied. And ultimately, that's not going to satisfy your heart. God alone, Christ alone satisfies the heart. And then everything you have, even the smallest thing, becomes a cause for joy and thanksgiving. But it was when I was about 17 years old, I was invited by a girl to go to church with her and her family. And I heard a message for the first time that really made me sit up and think. It was a message about what happens to you when you die. And I realized that all of my fame, all of my money, all of my popularity would not impress the God who made me and gave me those things one bit. And that's when I began reading the Word of God and going to church. And internally, as I began to see the righteous standards of God reflected in the Ten Commandments, and I began looking at myself in the mirror of those commandments, I could see myself as a filthy, wretched sinner. When I lifted the lid of my own heart, so to speak, looked down inside and saw the filth and the grime and all of the, the secret sin tucked in the corners that I didn't let anybody else see, I realized that I was what the Bible said. I was a sinner who was blind by my own sin, I was in desperate need of God to forgive me, to cleanse me on the inside. I looked really clean on the outside, but on the inside, my heart needed to be changed from one that loves sin and loves myself to one who loves God and wants to serve Him on His terms. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. In other words, abandon all your own ambition, all your own will, all your own direction, your own choices, and totally and fully submit your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It is to say it's the end of me and I commit my life to Christ to follow Him whatever the cost, even if it's a cross, and to obey Him. Now, that was not what the rich young ruler was willing to do. He is a classic illustration of someone who will not deny himself. He wanted to hold on to his own will. He wanted to hold on to his own pride. He wanted to hold on to his own money. He wanted to hold on to his own ambition, his own sovereignty, if you will, in his own life. Uh, the, the, the competing issues are these, very simple. The gospel says, give your life to Christ and he rules. And if you're not willing to do that, it's because you want to keep the rule of your own life. The rich young man wanted his own life for himself. He wanted to control his own life. He had his choice sins, he had his choice religion, and he wanted to hang on to control. It's that simple. Coming to Christ means you give up the control of your life and you yield it to Christ. That's what kept him from salvation. He was unwilling to do that. Because my career, my livelihood, and my reputation was pretty much built on pleasing people. It was a struggle for me to come to grips with what it meant to please God because you do that over against pleasing people. It's, it's a mutually exclusive thing. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And if any man desires to save his life, he'll lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will save it. And we don't live in a country where people are getting burned at the stake for following Jesus, but you sure can get blacklisted. You sure can lose out on opportunities because of it. I've had uh, people tell me, well, Kirk, you sure picked the wrong religion in Hollywood, didn't you? You could come in and say that you worship a tree and throw your arms around bark all day long, and people would say, hey, man, do whatever you want to do. Uh, that's cool. But you come in and say that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm born again. All of a sudden, people want to step 10 feet back and, and point their fingers at you. People are happy for you to believe in God. 
they think it's great that you believe in God. Uh, people applaud the idea of believing in God, as long as that God is not the God of the Bible. Because once you affirm the God of the Bible, then you get the God of the Bible. Then you get the law of the God of the Bible. You get the commandments of the God of the Bible. You get the morality of the God of the Bible. You get the holiness of the God of the Bible, the justice and righteousness of the God of the Bible, and you get the punishment of the God of the Bible. So, you have to face your own sinfulness, you have to face the reality that you have violated the law of God, that you're headed toward uh, uh, judgment in eternal hell, and in order to be saved from that, you have to turn from your sin and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. The bottom line is men love their sin. People love their sin. The Bible says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Now, there are all kinds of gods that aren't going to impinge on that, all kinds of religions, spiritual ideas, but not the God of the Bible. So to say that you believe in the God of Scripture is then to say that you believe in the law of the God of Scripture and the judgment of the God of Scripture as well as the salvation of the God of Scripture. It's that narrowness that offends the sinner because the sinner wants to hold on to his sin. The rejection of Christianity is not intellectual. It's not some intellectual problem, I just can't get there intellectually. There are endless reasons, logical reasons to believe in the, the God of the Scripture and the Scripture that God has written. It's moral. It's moral. They love the darkness because their deeds are evil. Not because they can't process it intellectually, but because their deeds are evil and they cherish those. You know, sometimes you'll hear people um, talking about how they found Jesus. Oh, so-and-so uh, in the news today, so-and-so uh, uh, found God. They found religion in jail or some celebrity found Jesus. And I remember reading in John's book, The Gospel According to Jesus, where he said, no, 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 th th that's, not, that's not right. You didn't find Jesus. Jesus wasn't lost. You were, and he found you. And I was thinking, Yes, that's it. That's exactly what happened. I wasn't seeking after the Jesus of the Bible. His demands are far too high. I mean, what God wants from me is total and complete surrender and a dying to myself. I wasn't looking for that. We, we always say that people aren't truly saved until they are truly aware that they are lost. You see, that's why you just can't go in and say, hey, let me tell you about this wonderful message. Jesus loves you. God loves you just the way you are. He, he wants to bless you, bump you up a few notches on the scale of success, help you hit home runs, straighten out your slice in golf, make you feel good about yourself, give you your, quote unquote, your best world, your fulfillment, your purpose. That's not the gospel. The gospel is he wants to deliver you from your sins which are going to condemn you to eternal hell. And until a person understands the reality of their lostness and fully comes to grips with that, that they have sinned against God, violated God's law, that they cannot remedy that, that they are headed for hell, that they will never have any purpose in this life, any meaning in this life, and certainly in the life to come, apart from salvation through Jesus Christ, they don't reach a level of desperation, uh, which drives them to a true salvation. I was lost, and God found me, and he drew me in to the truth of Scripture and caused me to embrace it with all of my heart. And that's the beauty of the power of God, to take a guy who's not seeking God at all and to seek him out, to find him and make him a new creature in Christ.